Good morning, Harvest Church. So glad that we're able to come together for another Sunday. So thank you for joining us. And if you're new and this is your first time, I just want to encourage you to please visit our website and connect with us there at harvestfamily.net. We'd love to hear from you and know if there's any ways we can partner with you. Um, I'm excited. We've been doing a study on the book of Esther. And if you haven't had the opportunity to hear the other weeks, please just go back and listen. But this is our last week. And so we're going to dive right in and um, continue talking about the book of Esther. So we've been studying this story. And we've been going through this story um, talking about the main characters. And one thing I've said every week over and over is that no matter what character you look at, no matter these big moments or the small moments, there's just this one great theme in the book of Esther. Even though we don't see God, he is absolutely, unequivocally in control. And so we started talking about Haman and how he allowed just... um, power and his thirst for power and ultimately a grudge to destroy him. He couldn't let go of his hatred towards the Jews and that was ultimately his downfall. And we talked about Mordecai and that was just such a fun week um, talking about this great man, how he was just such a humble man and he was able to trust God even though the future seemed like there was no hope. He believed in God's promises for his people and he was willing to stand when others were bowing. And so last week we talked about Esther. We finally got to Esther about how, you know, she didn't have the most lovely backstory. It was actually quite tragic. Her parents died when she was young. She was taken against her will to the palace, chosen to be queen to an unpredictable king. But in the midst of it, it's very clear that God's favor rested on Esther. And so we finally got to the part of her story where Mordecai tells her, who knows if perhaps you're made queen for such a time as this. And this is just such an incredible moment in the story where this exchange of communication is taking place. It's going back and forth between Mordecai. He's asking Esther to risk everything, even her life, and break court protocol and go before the king. And at first she doesn't want to. And that's when Esther or Mordecai responds to Esther by telling her, you're going to die with the rest of us, but maybe, just maybe, in God's great sovereignty, he put you in this position, one you didn't ask for or want, so that you could save your people. And that seemed to be what Esther needed to hear to summon up the courage to say, I will go before the king. And she, she was willing to risk it all, even her life. And she says, if I must die, I must die. Wow. We left off with Esther saying that she would go before the king. And so this morning, I just want to make a few more observations about this story before we put it to a close. Um, I've had such a great time looking at this book with you. And honestly, I've just been challenged in my own life. Uh, And so one thing I want to point out about Esther is this. We see that Esther stood too. We see that she stood too. I talked about how Mordecai refused to bow. And he was standing in a culture that was bowing. And here in this moment of the story that we're about to read, we see that Esther is going to stand. In Esther 5.1, it says, On the third day of the, fe- of the fast, Esther put on her royal robes, and she entered the inner court of the palace, and just across from the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne, facing the entrance, and when he saw Queen Esther standing... There in the inner court, he welcomed her, and he held out his golden scepter to her. So Esther approached and touched the end of the scepter. In this moment, we see Esther's doing the very thing that Mordecai had been doing and what he asked her to do. Esther is standing with everything in her. And it must have been telling her not to go in there, not to go through those doors. Run, save yourself. You're going to die. She chooses to walk through those doors and to stand there. Esther is able to approach that moment of truth and to step into the presence of the king calmly and wisely and confidently. I mean, look at her. She's not cowering. She doesn't cringe. The Bible doesn't say she ran away. She stands. Esther rose to the occasion and she stood her ground. You know, I heard this quote years ago and I've always remembered it and loved it. It says, your life is an occasion. Rise to it. We all have certain moments in our lives where we have the opportunity to rise to the occasion before us. We choose if we're willing to or not. On June 6, 1944, thousands of American paratroopers jumped into Normandy. Do you know they say four men refused to jump? Can you imagine 
can anyone imagine what the rest of those men's lives look like? They didn't have the courage to jump and they didn't rise to the occasion. Their lives in effect ended the moment they refused to leave that plane. And no doubt as she stood in that doorway awaiting the king's response, can you imagine Esther was probably saying to herself what Mordecai said to her? I'm here for such a time as this. I'm here for such a time as this. I'm here for such a time as this. And she stood there. It's, it's better to be a lion for a day than a sheep all your life. And Esther stood. She rose to the occasion and she stood. And, you know, another thing is Esther was willing to let go of her comfort. In other words, she braced the unknown. This is one of those things that's a lot more fun to talk about than to actually live out. But there are just moments when God is going to call us out of our comfort, out of our comfort zone, and he's going to ask us to walk into the unknown. And when Esther found out about the evil plan Haman had to get rid of all the Jews, she had a choice. She could do something about it or she could stay in the comforts of the palace and just keep quiet. The reason why I admire Esther so much is that not only is she willing to do something, and she does, she does it not knowing if she will live to see another sunrise. She literally didn't know what was going to happen to her when she went before the king unsummoned. It was stepping out into the unknown. And, and the known is comfortable. We like knowing what will happen. We like understanding what will be required, what steps to take. And there are times God is calling us that none of those will be answered. And for Esther, this was one of those times. When facing the prospect of death, Esther chose to be courageous. She chose to let go of her comfort and have courage and do what was being asked of her. You know, has God been asking you to leave a place of comfort? Has he asked you to do something like Esther that in fact is incredibly difficult and it doesn't make a lot of sense in the natural you know, God will always call us from a place of comf comfort, and it requires bold faith to leave that familiar territory for unknown territory. I've read about an old mariner's chart drawn up in 1525, and it's now on display in the British Museum in London, and it was outlining, outlining the North American coastline and adjacent waters, and the cartographer made some intriguing notions on the areas of the map that represented regions that hadn't been explored yet. He wrote, here be giants, here be fiery scorpi scorpions, here be dragons. Eventually, the map came into the possession of Sir John Franklin, a British explorer in the early 1800s. Scratching out those fearful inscriptions, he wrote these words across the map, here be God. In essence, Sir John, he's saying, I believe. I'm not sure what's, what's there, but I'm certain God is. And, and has God asked you to leave a place of comfort? You don't always know what's there, but we know God is. And let's be honest, 2020 has been a year of letting go of comforts, has it not? Think about it this morning, though. Where are you at? Has God been speaking to you about something in your life, an area he wants you to change, um, a habit he wants you to give up, an attitude he wants you to lose. You know, God doesn't ask us to leave a comfort zone once and then never again. It doesn't work that way. He's always calling us to grow and to stretch and to stand. God never holds before us an ordinary, mundane, satisfactory life. John 10.10 10 says in the Amplified, I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it's overflowing. C.S. Lewis said, too often we're like children who settle for playing in mud puddles when the beauty of and immensity of the ocean are just a few feet away. And so there just comes moments where we need to stop and examine our lives. We need to evaluate if anything in our life even requires faith. If not, chances are we're living very comfortable lives. There just comes times when we have to allow ourselves to feel this dissatisfied with our present condition, dissatisfied with how comfortable we've gotten, dissatisfied that we no longer use our faith muscle because nothing in the way we live requires us to do so. And Esther had to get to a place where the comfort of the palace was not enough to keep her from stepping out in faith and trusting God. She left that comfortable place and she got involved. She put herself right smack in the middle of things. Are you willing to leave a place of comfort when God's calling you to? And then when we look at Esther, we see this powerful truth that 
One life surrendered to God can make a huge difference. One life just takes one life. And sometimes it's hard to believe that one person can really make a difference, isn't it? Like in our overpopulated world, it's easy to underestimate the significance of one life. It's easy to underestimate the value of you, your vote, your convictions, your determination to say, I stand against this. We get caught up in all the what ifs and ask ourselves, what does it really matter if I get involved? But it matters greatly. And yeah, it's true. God has other ways to accomplish his purposes. He has other people he can use. He isn't frustrated or restrained because you and I may be indifferent. But what happens is we lose. We miss out. And how sad it is when we've been called for such a time as this, if we're not able to stand in that hour. What does your such a time as this moment look like? I mean, there are plenty of opportunities right now to stand and to get involved and to step out of your comfort. Can one person really make a difference? I think we all know the answer to that is yes. I want to read you a story of one woman whose life made an incredible difference. Ever since I read her story years ago, I think about her often. Um, I was so challenged by the, her story when I read it that it has been impactful in my life. And her name was Evelyn Brand. And when she was a young woman, she felt called by God to go to India. And as a single woman in 1909, a calling like that required a truckload of faith and an equal amount of determination. She married a young man named Jesse, and together they began to minister to people in rural, rural India, bringing education and medical supplies and building roads to reduce the isolation of the poor. Early in their ministry, they went seven years without a single convert. But then a priest of a local tribal religion developed a fever and grew deathly ill. Nobody else would go near him, but Evelyn and Jesse nursed him as he was dying. And he said, this God, your Jesus, must be the true God, because only Jesse and Evelyn will care for me in my dying. The priest gave his children to them to care for after he died. And that became a spiritual turning point for their, their ministry in that part of the world. People began to examine the life of Jesus and the teachings of Jesus, and, and increasing numbers began to follow him. Evelyn and Jesse had 13 years of productive ministry and service, and then Jesse died. And by this time, Evelyn was 50 years old, and everyone expected her to return home to England, but she would not do it. She stayed another 20 years under the mission board, and she served faithfully. Well, toward the end of her life, everyone called her Granny Brand, Granny Brand, and she had spent her life now in India, including those 20 years of widowhood. And at the age of 70, she received word from home that the missions office in England were not going to give her another five-year term. They felt like she was simply just getting too old, but she was also stubborn. A party was held to celebrate her time in India, and everyone there cheered her on. Have a good trip back home, they all said. I'll t and then she looked at them, and she said, I'll tell you a little secret. I'm not going back home. I'm staying in India. Evelyn had this little shack built with the little resources that she had, and then she bought a pony to get around the mountains, and she would ride from village to village on horseback to tell people about Jesus. And she did that for five years on her own. And one day at 75 years old, she fell and she broke her hip. Her son said to her, Mom, you've had a great run. God's used you, but your time is done. You need to come home now. I'm not going back home, she said. God gave me this mountain. She spent another eight years, friends, eight years traveling from one village to another on horseback. Falls, concussions, sickness, and aging could not stop her. And finally, when she hit 93 years old and she could not ride on horseback anymore, the men in these villages, because they loved Granny Brand so much, put her on a stretcher and they carried her from village to village. She lived two more years and gave those years as a gift, carried on a stretcher from village to village as she preached the gospel to people, the poorest of the poor. Can one life make a difference when it's surrendered to God? Absolutely it can. Question is, are you willing to believe that about your own life? When we surrender our wills to the Lord and we give him control, there's, there's no question that your life can make the absolute difference. And Esther's life made a difference to an entire group of people.
And the last thing I want to point out today is that Esther understood God's timing. She was patient. You know, God's timing is just so different than our own. I mean, we often get frustrated when God doesn't work within, you know, the parameters that we've set out or what we understand. But he's God and his perspective on time is so different and it's beyond our capacity to understand. There's just dimensions to it that we aren't fully going to understand here. I love what Charles Swindoll said. He said, our entire perspective is based on this moment in which we find ourselves. We speak of present, the past, and the future. If we want to know the hour or the minute or the second, we merely look at our watch. If we want to know how the day or the month or the year or the century, we look at the calendar. Time, easily marked, carefully measured, it's all very objective, measurable, understandable, and conscious. God is not like that at all. As a matter of fact, he lives and moves outside the realm of earthly time, beyond the ticking of our clocks and beyond the turning of our calendar. God has no night. God has no day. God has no month. God has no year. God has no past, present, or future. He transcends it all. And we see our life in a sequence of frames moving from one to the other like a movie. Not God. He sees all the movie of our life, all at once, in a flash, along with millions and billions of others going on simultaneously, past, present, and future. Esther was able to trust God's timing on things. We read that she went in the king, and the king holds out the golden scepter, and then in Esther 5.3, the king said to her, what's troubling you, Queen Esther? What's, What's your request? Even if it's half of my kingdom, it will be given to you. Now think about this, guys. This is her moment to bring down Haman. She can say it all right there because the king has asked her, what is the matter? But she doesn't. She understood God's timing and she wasn't in a hurry. Remember, she's been waiting on the Lord and fasting. So in Esther 5.4, it says, if it pleases the king, may the king and Haman um, this day come to a banquet that I prepared for him. Again, notice what she doesn't do. She doesn't point her finger at Haman. She doesn't rush ahead and tell the king what's troubling her. Even though he's asked her, she doesn't play on his emotions or try to manipulate him by bursting into tears. She just very calmly says, I planned a banquet and I'd love for you and Haman to attend. And of course, the king is like, oh yeah, absolutely. Banquets are my jam. So here she is at a banquet with the king and Haman. And again, she still hasn't told the king what's troubling her, but he knows something's wrong because she wouldn't have risked coming before his presence if something, if she didn't have a very good reason. And as they're sitting together at the feast, he asks again, Esther, what is your petition? For it shall be granted to you. And what is your request? Even if it's half my kingdom, it shall be done. And here's just where it gets interesting. She doesn't tell the king. She, she shows such great restraint and trust in God's timing. She simply asked the king and Haman for another banquet the next evening. Again, I can't imagine what it would have been like to sit at a table with just the king and Haman, the man that you know is trying to kill all of your people. How smug and arrogant he must have been thinking, I'm at a, I'm at a banquet just with the queen and the king. And she endured that gracefully. And she patiently just asked for another night. She trusted God's timing and she asked for another banquet. And remember, this part of the story is where as Haman leaves this banquet, he bumps into Mordecai and Mordecai won't bow down to him and he's furious. And this is where he comes up with the plan to kill Mordecai the next morning. This is also the night where the king couldn't sleep, remember? And so he finds out through a process of things that Mordecai actually saved his life and he was never rewarded for it. You know, God's timing, it required another day. God's timing, his plan required another night. And Esther was sensitive to that. It just makes me challenge myself and ask myself, am I sensitive to God's timing in my life? Even when it doesn't make sense. It's it's at this second banquet with Esther and and the king and Haman that Esther finally answers the question the king has asked her two other times before. She knew when to act and she knew when to wait. And so Esther begins to tell the king of the plot against the Jews. And then in Esther 7, 5, the king says, who would do such a thing? Who would would be so presumptuous as to touch you? Time out. I just have to say, at this point, I would have lost my patience. 
I would have said, what do you mean has done this? You were there. You signed the decree. You and Haman were drinking the night after you did that. You agreed to this. And it's just a good thing that this story is about Esther and not Shekinah, because that probably would have been the end of the Jews right there in Persia. But in this moment, Esther begins to talk with the king and she wisely chose her words. And because of this, the king was able to receive what she was saying. And in, in Esther chapter seven, the whole chapter is just um, devoted and we, to Haman's demise. We see as Esther tells him all of what's been going on and we see it play out where eventually the king orders Haman to be killed. And here's what I think is just so incredible and so encouraging for us as we study this part of the story, how suddenly things shifted in the story. One moment, all the Jews were counting down the days until they were going to be murdered. And the next mo moment, a new decree is going out throughout the empire. Suddenly things changed. And I think we get so stuck in our situations and we believe that they're permanent. It's just hard to see outside of the moment and we can't see our way out and we can't see things being different. But if God can move the heart of a king, he certainly can move um, on an entire nation. And, and that's the hope I find in the book of Esther. It's the hope it gives me for this moment right now in history, the moment that we're living. It's just that no barriers too high, no chasm too wide for God. He's not limited by space or time, by the visible or invisible. He's all powerful. And when God is ready to move, he moves. And so maybe just maybe we can experience a suddenly moment ourselves where things can change and turn. I know that's what I'm praying for. The king's heart changed. Think about it. This man was willing to go along with Haman's plot and get rid of a, you know, an entire race of people. This is the king who, when his thumb is up, people lived, and when it was down, they, they died. And all of a sudden, this king has changed his mind. He held out that golden scepter to Esther and said, why are you upset, and what can I do for you? And he listened to what, es as Esther explained, and and then he ordered that Haman be put to death. Esther 8.1 says, On that same day, King Xerxes gave the property of Haman, the enemy of the Jews, to the queen Esther. Then Mordecai was brought before the king, for Esther had told the king how they were related. The king took off his signet ring, which had been taken back from Haman, and he gave it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed Mordecai to be in charge of Haman's property. <sighs> wow. In just a, just a few chapters earlier, we see Mordecai and Esther in tears and fear for the lives of their people, fasting and praying. They chose to trust God. They stepped out in faith and boldness, and look how God honored it. Not only are the Jews saved, but the king has now given all of his land and possessions to Esther, who has turned and turn put Mordecai in charge, all of Haman's land and possessions. Esther then tells the king who Mordecai is to her. And again, this just to me points out how humble Mordecai really was because he never leveraged his um, relationship with Esther. He never le leveraged her position as queen to advance himself in the court. And so if we learn anything from the book of Esther, it's that no matter how bad things look or seem, in a moment things can change. The story went from Esther 4.3, there was great mourning among the Jews, they fasted and wept and wailed to Esther 8.16, and the Jews had joy and gladness and were honored everywhere. It just all changed in a moment. And this is such a great reminder for us. We can't just judge things based on how they appear right now. And I know it can be hard not to do that. It's very easy to get caught up in what we read and what we're see all the images that we're seeing. But in one moment, everything can change. You know, the story of Esther has to be one of the greatest endings of all time. I don't know about you, but I hate watching a movie or reading a book where um, there's no real closure it, or watching a show. It just drives me nuts. I love closure. And this book in the Bible just has great closure. Esther 9.1 says, so on March 7th, the two decrees of the king were put into effect. On that day, the enemies of the Jews had hoped to overpower them but quite the opposite happened. It was the Jews who overpowered their enemies. 
I, I really like what one author says and his take on the ending of this book. He said, the conclusion of this story is told without any suspense because the outcome of this story has never really been in question. Remember what Mordecai says to Esther in Esther 4, 14. He says, if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. And who knows whether you are not in this um, kingdom for such a time as this. Notice there's no question in Mordecai's mind about the outcome of the story. There's no suspense about whether or not God's people will be delivered. If you had asked Mordecai how God's people would be delivered, he would say, who knows? Maybe God will use Esther or maybe she'll stay silent. I don't know. But one thing's for certain, God will deliver his people. God had made promises to his people. Jeremiah 32, 38, they will be my people and I will be their God. And so the deliverance of God's people was never really in question. And this story was always going to end with God keeping all of his promises, with his people being delivered and the enemies being judged. And I don't know, you know, we live in a world full of uncertainty, a world full of suspense. But here's the thing. Just like the book of Esther, there is no suspense about how our story is going to end. That author I just quoted said one other thing. He said, in the end, God wins, and he keeps all of his promises. It's true that the middle of our story may go a number of ways. In the middle of our story, sometimes God's enemies seem to have it all. In the middle of our story, sometimes God's people suffer. In the middle of our story... If someone asks how God could possibly keep his promises, sometimes the best answer we can come up with is, who knows? We don't always understand what God is doing, and we don't always know what, why he lets certain things happen in the middle of our stories. But Esther comes to tell us a different story. Esther reminds us that there is no suspense about how the story is going to end. Even when the past seems uncertain, the end remains unchanged. In the end, God wins. In the end, God delivers his people. In the end, God keeps his promises. Only such a glorious and all-knowing God would have his hand on some forgotten orphan, a little girl who lost her mother and father. Only such sovereignty and providence would be at work in the life of a lowly little Jew living in exile in the great land of Persia. Here's a, a little girl who's lost so much in the death of her parents and being orphaned, Yet years later, she would become the very survival to her people, the Jews. God and God alone can do such a thing. And what I want us to take away from this story is he does do such things. He's working silently and, in, and invisibly behind the events of history. And I believe he's working today as events are unfolding. And like, you know... I've said a lot through this series, Esther is the only book in the Bible not to mention the name of God, and that's not to say he was absent. His presence permeates the story as we've seen over these past few weeks. He's clearly working behind the scenes, coordinating coincidences and circumstances to make his will happen. And when events seemed out of control to Esther and Mordecai, when the king dictated ruin for their people, when evil was poised to triumph, God was at work. He was at work through their dark days when Esther was taken to the harem. He was at work through their faithful obedience, Esther risking her life to go before the king, and their victories, Esther revealing Haman's plot and Jews and destroying the enemies. The message is clear. God is sovereign, even when life doesn't make sense, and God is also a great promise keeper. And someone needs to hear that this morning, that God keeps his promises. And in a moment, Everything can change suddenly. And I, I love this summary I read of the book of Esther. It says, we learn in Esther's story, his hand moves invisibly, yet with invincibility, bringing his sovereign plan to completion. It includes haunting delays that seem unfair, unfair human decisions that lack compassion, harmful deeds that bring other anguish and hurtful disappointments that make us question God's goodness. But nevertheless, he pursues with persistence, and God refuses to be distracted. In the end, God wins, and what a great comfort that brings. So as we end our time and as we conclude the book of Esther, I hope you're greatly encouraged by the notion that God truly is in control in your life. And while all the circumstances, you may not always understand what's going on, he's in control, and he is a promise keeper, and things can change suddenly. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for our time together, and I thank you for 
your children who have chosen to spend this time together, Lord. And I, I pray that you would speak to them and you would encourage them and challenge them. God, you know who's watching right now and you know what they need. And so, Lord, I'm, I'm so thankful that I can stand here and agree and believe with them that you're going to get that to them. And Lord, I just pray that we would be people who would, in this moment of history, be believing for a, a sudden change, that we would be praying and fasting as Esther and the Jews did, asking for your intervention, Father God. And I pray if there's someone here watching who doesn't know you, that even in this moment, they would reach out and call out to you. Your word says, God, that when we call out to you, you will answer us. And so I, if you're here and you're watching and you don't know the Lord, a simple prayer to him, just asking him to come into your heart and to change you and to forgive you of your sins. You just pray that prayer and he will answer you and he will come and be with you and be in control of your life. And Lord, I just thank you that a life surrendered to you can make the difference. And we know right now in this time in history, we need difference. We need a different way. We need difference. We need people who will make a difference. And so God, if you're calling your people, I pray we'd be bold enough to answer, bold enough to come out of a place of comfort. Lord, I thank you that you are speaking to us and challenging us. And God, you are not done yet. And so thank you for the call on our lives. And I just I pray, Lord, that we would make a difference in this moment in history. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for being with us this morning. I pray that you were encouraged and that the Lord just spoke directly to you. And um, our, our harvest staff misses you and we pray for you. And just know that we're here. If you need to just be um, encouraged, please reach out. If you need prayer, please reach out or something else. Uh, we want to partner with you in this season and you are on our hearts and in our minds and in our prayers. And so be blessed, Harvest Church, and um, have a wonderful week, and we love you, and we're praying for you. God bless you. <laughs>